I'm Victor Spencer and I'm uh, the Aquarium Supervisor at Golf Specimen Marine Lab here in Panacea, Florida. Okay. And a few weeks ago you had a call about a Kemp's Ridley turtle. Can you tell us about that? Yes, we, we got a call from a turtle in distress over in Alligator Harbor and went over to pick up the turtle. Um, the shell on the turtle, the laminae on the shell, had, had sloughed off. The uh, shell was covered with bacteria and, and algae, it turns out. And the state uh, has determined that they think it's a necrotizing bacteria that has eaten, eaten away the, uh, the carapace and the plastron on that animal. Necrotizing bacteria in, in turtles, it is fairly common in areas where they'll do uh, aquaculture of turtles, uh, they all have problems with necrotizing bacteria. Here in the states, when you go further down towards the uh, Tampa Bay area where we have trouble with the, uh, the melanomas on green turtles, they found green turtles with necrotizing bacteria and the state said that they've actually had some loggerheads. As far as I know, in our area here though, this is the first Kemp Ridley that I've ever heard of having that necrotizing bacteria. Oftentimes, that bacteria is associated with pollutants in the area. And I would expect as our dead areas at our rivers, as the pollution uh, continues to congregate at the mouths of the rivers and we pollute the Gulf more, things like that may become more common in this area. I can't tell you that there's dispersant in the area or not because I have no way to test for dispersant. But when something of this magnitude happens and there's this huge uh, influx of pollutant into the Gulf, and then you suddenly have more turtles than normal are washing up on the beaches and dying. You get something new like this necrotizing bacteria. You have to look at that the most simple solution is probably the correct one. And I would expect that it had to have a lot to do with these turtles becoming uh, infected or sick. We've lost a lot of Kemp Ridley turtles this year, more than double what would normally be washed up on the beach. So I would have to say that it would have to be part of the problem. We used to have what would have been a semi-open system. Years ago, we would have been an open system, just pumping water directly from the bay. As the area has built up and we have more and more of a population base, we've gotten more pollutants in the area. And we had to go from an open system, even a few years ago, to a semi-closed system. So we would bring water in and we'd treat it and then add it into our aquarium. When the oil spill happened, there would be no way, if we got oil or if we got dispersants in the area, that we could pump that water directly into the aquarium. So we had to go through and replumb the aquarium to make this a closed system. So we've gone through and we've dug up all of the drains, we've replaced all of our drain lines, uh, we've reformed uh, a lot of the plumbing and filtration systems that we have so that the aquarium operates fully as a closed system right now. We still bring water in from the bay, but that water is, goes through ozone treatment, uh, foam fractionators, uh, UV sterilizers before it's ever entered into our system now. And you were showing us some sea urchins inside and how you were testing, using them to test the water. Can you explain that again? So sea urchins are a really good indicator species, even in, in a home aquarium. If you've got problems with your water quality in a home aquarium, if you put sea urchins in your tank, if you have problems with the urchins, then you can pretty much say that you've got problems with your water quality. Here in our aquarium, because we're using natural seawater and we're filtering and cleaning it, urchins do really well in our facility. If I'm going to bring water in from the bay now and I want to see that that water is clean and it's good for use in our aquarium, I would test that by uh, injecting some sea urchins with potassium chloride and then uh, fertilizing the eggs and samples of seawater to see how the fertilization progresses. Do I get a fertilization membrane? Are the eggs dividing? And in 18 to 24 hours, am I getting a pluteus larva uh, swimming in the water column? And that's what I would look at to tell if our water is safe to use now. And since the oil spill, have you tested the water? In the we, bay? we have tested the water. We, uh, we don't have a way to test for dispersants. We don't have a test that I can go out and say there, there's oil or there's dispersed oil, there's dispersant in the bay. So what we have to do is we'll bring in samples of water and again we're starting to check them with sea urchin eggs now. And if the eggs will develop through to that pluteus stage, I I'm, have to assume that that water is, is safe to use. And why can't you test for dispersants? 
haven't been able to get anyone to tell us what the ingredients of uh, the dispersant are. And even when you uh, watch on the news at the testing that our government's doing, they're not testing for uh, what might be considered the hazardous chemicals that would be in the dispersant. They're testing for the DOS or the soap base. Uh, what they say is like 24% of this uh, dispersant is this DOS. And that's what they're testing for in our seafood, or they're testing for because I, I guess the smell test that they use, they say it smells like Windex. So if you get some, some water in out of the bay and it smells like Windex, I guess I could say that either someone's dumped Windex or we have dispersant in the bay. But I don't have a chemical test that I can use for it. And uh, as far as I see in the news and, and some of the uh, congressional hearings that are going on, the government doesn't have a test to test for uh, the other chemicals in dispersant.